being in conservation is not easy. It's often discouraging. We see things we love disappearing very often. So you've got to keep that passion. You, you've got to have that passion. And I often say when, when I hire staff is I should hire for attitude and train everything else because the attitude is the one thing that you can't change. So if you're passionate about conservation, you will make it happen. Welcome to The Possibilists. The Possibilists is a podcast collaboration between the Smithsonian Earth Optimism and Pelicanus. The Smithsonian Conservation Commons Earth Optimism Initiative is changing the conservation narrative from one that focuses on problems and perils to highlighting impactful solutions. By celebrating what's working in conservation, they seek to inspire action and move global community from a sense of loss to one of hope and finding solutions to save our planet. Pelicanus is a conservation-based collective and continuous wonder of the healing and encouragement that is possible on this planet and the people making it happen. We are committed to telling these stories and demonstrating optimism through science. Now in this partnership, we spotlight conservationists working with a possibilistic attitude for solution-based efforts to tackle the world's critical environmental struggles. We're attempting to reframe the narrative around conservation to show that conservation successes are possible through changes in attitude and implementation of intentional change. This episode of The Possibilist features Dr. Judy Mann. Dr. Mann is the conservation strategist at the South African Association for Marine Biological Research, also called SAMBRA. SAMBRA and Dr. Mann do so much for the conservation of marine resources in Southern Africa and beyond. So I'll just let Dr. Mann tell us all about their amazing work. Uh, welcome to The Possibilist. Uh, do you mind introducing yourselves and telling us who you work for? Hi guys, um, and what a pleasure it is to, to be here. Thank you for the invitation. My name is Dr. Judy Mann, and I work for the South African Association for Marine Biological Research, which is a really big mouthful. So we just call it SAMBRA for short. We're based in Durban on the east coast of South Africa. It's lovely weather here. We generally have a, a really nice tropical climate. So that's us, and that's where I am on the Indian Ocean. I don't know, to me, that just sounds like fun <laughs> to be on the Indian Ocean <laughs> and being in that part of the world. Um, so you mentioned Somber. Can you, uh, I, I was looking through your guys' website. It seems like you do so much. Uh, with, I think there's a couple different branches of work you guys can do. So do you mind just kind of like telling us what Somber is and what Somber does generally? That's a really good question. And I think that it's one that's, it's not that difficult to explain. Our organization was started way back in the 1950s. So it's over 70 years old now. And it was really started with the aim of, of helping people to get maximum benefit from the ocean because they realized that people were going to be needing food. And it really started in the olden days when people did lovely field trips. And so they were exploring. And these people from Durban, scientists from Durban, were exploring up the East Coast, which used to be called Tonga land. And they saw these incredible biodiversity. And at that time, South Africa, and in particular, KwaZulu-Natal was really focused on saving terrestrial biodiversity. So you might have heard of the, the white rhino, which was going extinct, and it was really being, being poached into extinction. So there was an incredible emphasis on saving the rhino, saving terrestrial biodiversity, but nobody was really looking at the ocean. So they said, right, what we're going to do is we're going to form a research institute, and we are going to study the ocean, and we're going to do pre practical research on the ocean. So we're going to look at things like stock assessments. We're going to look at what species people can use. We're going to look at growth rates. We're going to understand the fish in the ocean, and we're going to do this applied research to help people. And that was quite a novel idea, because if you think back then, the, the solution to pollution was dilution. And in those days, people looked out and there were plenty of fish in the sea, so to speak. So people didn't actually realize that we might actually really, really need to start looking after our ocean. So, so these forefathers of our organization were very, very far-sighted, and, and they really knew a thing or two way back then. So they came back from this wonderful expedition, and they said, right, 
oh, dearie me, it costs a lot of money to do research. What are we going to do? How are we going to make some money? And then they had the bright idea that they would build an aquarium. And then people were going to pay money to visit the aquarium. And that money was going to then be used to keep the aquarium going and pay for the research, which was a, a really good theory, except they really underestimated how much it cost to keep an aquarium going. But nevertheless, they built their aquarium, they got it going, and they got the Research Institute going. And it was small, it wasn't very big, but it was doing really groundbreaking research. And it was the only marine research station on the east coast of Africa. A lot of research had happened down in Cape Town, but very little was actually happening on the east coast. And the aquarium was obviously an amazing place for people to, to come and see animals that they'd never seen before. So it was one of the very, very early aquariums aquariums in, in Africa, really. And so that's been our model. In the 1970s, we started to realize that they needed some education. So that's when there was the start of our education department. And things have been growing basically since, since then. So right now, our organization consists of three sections. We've got the Oceanographic Research Institute, which is where we have a whole team of scientists and support staff one of the best marine libraries in the country because obviously it's got a long history and that's where our scientists work. We've got Ushaka SeaWorld, which is our new home. We moved from the old premises about 15 years ago to a new home at based at Ushaka Marine World. So that's our aquarium. And then we've got the education department, which is a really, really critical role for us to play um, because we're able to inspire children and teachers to care for the ocean. Most South Africans are not really maritime people. It's, it's not something that's, that's natural to, to the majority of South Africans who live inland. And through the aquarium, we're able to, to introduce children and adults aged from naught to 80 or 100 to, to the ocean and, and just inspire people to care because people definitely won't care for something that they've never heard of or they don't know exist. And we always say that our role is to to roll back that blue blanket that covers the ocean and reveal what's beneath it. So it's a lovely model. We can use the research and the findings of the research to help management of our marine resources. So we do a lot of advice to government. We can use that strong research in our aquarium and we can put it all together with education to help people to care for the ocean, which is the mission statement of Sombra. Your title is conservation strategist. Uh, do you mind explaining what that means and what your role is at Sombra? So I've been through through various roles at Sombra. I have worked for the organization since 1992, which makes me feel very old. But I've, I've been so lucky to, to work for an organization whose mission is exactly what I, I've wanted to do my whole life, which is, is helping people to care for the ocean. So my current role as conservation strategist has got a few sides to it. The one thing is to look at what our organization does and see how it impacts on conservation. So how can we pull our various threads together, our coastal zone research management team, our marine protected areas, our lionfish research team? Um, how do we pull all of those different sides of the research together with the aquarium and the education to optimize the, the conservation benefits of Sambra? Where can we best contribute to conservation in our country and, and looking at the big picture of, of what South Africa and some basically Southern Africa, the East Coast of, of Africa needs. So that's the one side of it is looking at the conservation side. I'm responsible for almost all of our communication work. So our social media, our website, the production of resources, um, new initiatives. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about Marine Protected Areas Day a bit later. So initiatives like that. And then part of my role is to actually represent Sambra on various boards and committees. Uh, for example, I serve on the International Zoo Educators Association Board, um, on the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums Conservation Committee. So those are parts of my role as well, to make sure that, that we, we're working really with, with experts around, around the world and making sure that what we do is, is in line with, with international best practice.
Do you mind kind of sharing some of the research that your organization has done and some of the initiatives that you guys have started in the recent years? So that's one of the things that I, I love about conservation is, is the chance to, to do research that has impact. I don't think that I could ever be one of those scientists that does research just to produce a paper and hope that somebody reads it. It's, it's got to be more than that. And I think that our research nowadays, we, we just don't have the luxury to do that, that fundamental research, which is important. And there are countries that can really afford it. But, but we really need to do research for conservation that makes, makes a difference. So if I had to think of some of our research, I look um, at a lot of our lionfish research. So our scientists have worked on fish that are caught by rod and line along the coast. And many of these are from the family Sferidae or the sea breams, and they're really quite unique. Some of them are endemic. They're not found anywhere else in the world. Some of the Sferid species that we have, many of them are really slow growing. So they reach ages in excess of 40 or 50 years. Many of them are pretty resident, so they stay in one place. And some of them exhibit spawning aggregations. So one of my favorite stories is the 74. Now, the 74 is one of these sea breams, and it's an endemic sea bream. It's not found anywhere else in the world. And the 74 was basically being fished to commercial extinction way back in the 60s. And our scientists started doing research on them. And they were, were basically tracking the species numbers going down, 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 down. And eventually, after many, many years of research and talking to the government, they put a moratorium. So people were not allowed to catch the 74 anymore. It's now been whew, many, many years, over 10, 15 years since the moratorium was imposed. And the great news is this species of fish is coming back. It's recovering and we're starting to see catches of 74 more and more. And that's just one example of, of a success story with, with some of our research. And that's a combination of research together with good management, good legislation, and, and the cooperation of, of the fishermen. Um, our work also involves a lot of work on marine protected areas. So our organization has been involved in the promulgation of a number of marine protected areas along the coast, and then also doing research to look at the effects of those marine protected areas. More recently, um, some of the research that I've been involved in is studying people. So I started off studying fish and very soon realized that conservation is actually more about people than it is about animals. The, the fish will probably look after themselves, but we really need to understand humans. And that was why I ended up doing my PhD on how people learn about the ocean uh, in a multicultural society. And I really enjoyed that research because it's, it's revealed to me how each of us wears invisible lenses. So I look at the environment through my my set of glasses. It's my culture, it's how I've been raised, it's what I believe in, it's my values, it's the community. Everybody doesn't see the world in the same way. And it takes an effort to take your glasses off and look at your world through different eyes. And that's the research that I'm really enjoying is, is working with communities, working with people and starting to, to see the world slightly differently. And then through that, helping to connect with people. We're starting to change some of the way we do interpretation in the aquarium because we're looking at, at how do we interpret this not just through the lens of a scientist, how do we interpret this through the lens of a fisherman, through the lens of a mother, through the lens of all sorts of different people, through the lens of a capitalist who just wants to, to eat what's in the exhibits? Or it's, uh, it's, it's really looking at, looking at the world differently. And I'm, I'm enjoying the research that we're doing on that front, which is our, our visitor research program. We are at an interesting time um, in history, I guess, because, you know, when I was, in, even when I was in college, you know, geez, almost 20 years ago, you just didn't hear anyone talk about that outside of the classroom. You didn't hear anyone talk about either of these things outside of the classroom. And now, you know, every day you watch the news, someone brings up, you know, climate change or, or, or something that comes uh, along with that. And it's kind of what you, 
you get when you have all these education programs that started in the 80s and 90s and then people like us are coming into them it's like oh now we're we we are coming into our adulthood with these ideas and then we take that and grow from there when when i started out in the 90s doing environmental education so i started my career as our education officer and it was a very nice little job so i was going to go and play with the kids and play with the teachers and it was something that was it was not like really important but but it was it was a good job to have and it it would probably be a lot of fun and it's interesting because now environmental education is absolutely critical and we're seeing that if if we had communicated a lot more effectively and with a lot more energy 20 years ago perhaps we wouldn't be facing the crises that we're facing now so i think that we've seen a massive shift in terms of of the critical role that we play as communicators so sciences has always been there but i think that role as as communicators is becoming so so important and then the other role is is the social science role the understanding people so those are probably two of the biggest shifts i've seen is the shift from from the need to communicate our science in the past a scientist could get away with publishing and it didn't really matter if anyone read his papers or her papers or not whereas now i think that more and more scientists want their their work to be used and we have a social contract to actually make sure that our science is used we have a responsibility to to the people who pay for our research to make that make sure that it's it's relevant and that people can understand it and use it so i think we've seen a massive change in in attitudes over the last 20 30 years that's that's for sure every every point that you're making i'm i'm asking myself where do i sign up for the church of dr judy man cuz uh i i'm loving everything you're saying here <laughs> um I mean specifically like we have a social contract to make sure our work is used. I I I couldn't agree more with that. Um and I think you choose conservation like you said, you choose conservation to make sure that your work is used. Um and that it doesn't it isn't just basic science. That does have a role and does have a purpose, but the people that are choosing this profession um are trying to find that nexus between good science and and good practical application. I love how you're talking about, you know, having a different lens. Um as Austin mentioned, we were both in environmental education. I I ran a nature center for a while, and we're both really tall guys, and so I had all of my education up at my eye level. And then I did a class with a photographer one one week. It was a summer camp, and I gave all of the kids digital cameras. And it was a you know go take photos of it was on a wetland so go take photos in the wetland and for whatever reason they all they all stuck to the nature center and all the a lot of the photos that i got back were all at my knee level um <laughs> and so it, that's where i was storing all of the the used aquariums it was where i was storing all of the you know the it was just a storage area although everywhere by my feet And so what I decided to do once I got all those photos back cuz I literally got to see the world through their lens I got to see the world through their eyes I took all of the education everything we had I put it all at knee level and I realized what am I doing if they can't see it so I've used that for myself as a metaphor to say you know I'm only seeing it even if it's just a slight shift vertically <laughs> it's it's a metaphor for how we're all engaging in the world in a completely different way so i'm really grateful for uh different lenses <laughs> well, for for me it it's been i did a lot of work in the early years with rural fishing communities so working with mussel collectors working with fishermen mm. up and down the coast and these were people who rely on the ocean for their food and we were just starting with co-management in those days and and my role was to come and talk about ecosystems and about growth rates and about sustainability and what i found really fascinating was hearing their understanding and interpretation of of natural phenomena 
So the one, one example I always remember is we were talking about muscle recruitment and the fact that there are male muscles, the mollusk on the rocks, and there are female muscles and they produce egg and sperm. And, and from that come the baby muscles. And they told me that it wasn't that way and that the muscles came from the rains. And I took a little bit of time because if you believe the muscle comes from the rain, then looking after the muscles on the rocks is not necessarily important. So it took a little while for me to realize that recruitment of baby muscles happened at the same time as the spring rains happened. So that was where that interpretation came from. So we could work from that basis and then work forward, showing them exactly how muscles do reproduce, tying it together with the tides and tying it together with, with the, the spring rains. And it was just a, a really important realization to take a step back, look at, look at the traditional knowledge, look at what people know, look at how they're harvesting naturally, and then move forward from then, as opposed to just coming in with sort of Western scientific approaches. So again, just another example of, of changing lenses and seeing the world through, through different eyes. I, I absolutely love that. That's not just for the case study that it is, but as a wonderful metaphor as well, um, because I'm also a qualitative researcher and I, I work within the realm of vernacular conservation, the idea of using the local vernacular um, to, to help meet mutually beneficial goals. And so that's exactly it. Yeah, the, the muscles come with the rain. Well, what does that mean? What are we even talking about when we say that? That's, that's really special. Can you, with everything you've just mentioned, uh, with uh, all the social science and all the collaboration you've done, can you explain how and, and why you got involved with the, uh, the Reverse the Red? Uh, initiative? So the Reverse the Red is an interesting initiative because it's a partnership. And I think that in conservation, everything needs to be a partnership. I think that the, the sooner we put aside our, our logos and our egos and we start really working together, the better things will be for, for all of us. So that was one thing that attracted me to, to Reverse the Red. I was invited by a colleague from Zoos Victoria, Dr. Jenny Gray. She said, we've got this Reverse the Red. Um, she is really involved in WASA. She's the ex-president of the World Association of Zoos and Aquarium. He's one partner in Reverse the Red. And she said, come and join us because we, we're really looking at a, as a social movement and we need to to work on on how to make that social movement really effective and that was really how I got involved she told me the story of reverse the red and I went mm, I think this is something that that I could really believe in and contribute to because a of the partnership with WASA, the um, IUCN, Species Survival Commissions, um, with the Smithsonian, with Optimism, with uh, San Diego Wildlife Alliance, with Tangle Bank, and with another partner, and I can't think of its name right now, but it's a, a multi a multi organization partnership. And I think that that's what we need. I think that for, for too long, conservation has, has just competed with itself. So everybody is, is competing for funding. Everyone's competing for, for the, the highest profile in conservation. And if we could all just work together, if we could communicate the same types of messages more effectively, the public wouldn't be getting as confused as they, they currently are. And I think Reverse the Red is a lovely positive story. So it combines together things that are, are important to me, which is, is telling positive stories. I, read a long time ago, preach love, not loss. And I think that for so long we've preached loss and the importance of, of bringing in the positive side. It brings together multiple partners, but it's also really action orientated. So it's not about a, a feel good of, of we'll all sit together and say, right, we're going to reverse the red. It actually is action orientated. It's building metrics to measure that action, because I think that the measurement side of conservation is something that has been lacking for a long time. We can throw enormous amounts of money at a project without really expecting many results, but because it feels like we're doing the right thing, it's, it's okay. So I think that the measurement side of it, I think that it's a combination of in the ground, on the field conservation together with the social movement. So it's, it's ticking a lot of boxes in terms of what I believe in in conservation. And ultimately, if we can reverse the red for more and more species, 
that's that's what we're here for. We're here to make a difference for our environment. And it's got the social side to it too, which is obviously appealing to me. So yeah, um, that sort of is a, is a quick summary of, of Reverse the Red and, and my involvement. I've only been with the team for a short while, but I'm looking forward to seeing how it grows and, and contributing to that. I mean, maybe, like I said, you've only been with the team for a short while, but can you kind of, I don't know, maybe see how or show how um, this Reverse the Red initiative is connecting with your specific work in South Africa? I think that it connects, it connects in a number of different ways with our work in South Africa. So a number of our scientists work on red list assessments. So that's a very natural fit with reverse the red. We feel that we've been able to reverse the red in some cases, which is, is been very positive. But I think that it's it's sharing the reverse, the red good news in a wider context with South African, with other zoos and aquariums in South Africa, with our research institutes and with our conservation bodies. So it's it's taking the reverse the red message. It's being able to work with a number of organizations doing the red lists, doing the conservation actions on the ground. And it's it's tying it all together with the, the social side and the, the social movement and looking broader than just South Africa. So looking at Africa. Um, at the moment, Reverse the Red doesn't have a big footprint in Africa. And how can we increase that? We've got amazing colleagues in the rest of Africa working on very similar issues. How can we all work together? How can we use our, our resources more effectively for a greater conservation impact? I guess one of my bigger questions was saying that conservation is about people has the ability to make a lot of sense with the general public. Um, and I think some people can start to intuitively get it, but I have found when I have said something similar, I get a lot of pushback from other conservation professionals, um, because it's the fear of saying it's only about, uh, anthropic reasoning, um, not saving the, 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 the forests, the animals, the plants for the sake of themselves. And so I'm just curious to how you respond to that, because I disagree with that, but I go in a bunch of different ways with my answer. And so I was just curious what your thoughts were are when you say that conservation is, is about people and um, have you had any pushback on that? It's an interesting question. So I am married to a natural scientist, a fish biologist who is absolutely passionate about marine protected areas and lionfish. He is one of the scientists in our organization. So that's his, that's his passion. And we have this debate quite often about people and conservation. So I think there are two sides to that question. When I say conservation is about people, I mean that achieving conservation is about people. I don't mean that conservation is only for people. So I truly believe that we need wilderness areas. We need areas that are set aside to be as natural as possible. But I don't believe that those wilderness areas should exclude people completely. If I can't go for a walk in a forest, then I am going to question why that forest is there. So I think that Areas that have been set aside for nature are really, really important. And if they can be very, very light touch from humans in our um, national parks, in some of our KZN parks, we've got wilderness zones. You're not allowed to drive in those wilderness zones. You can only walk into them. But by walking into them, I can feel nature. I can feel the environment. I can be in, in an area that is as natural as it has ever been. And I can feel that it touches my spirit. And those wilderness areas are so, so important. So conservation is about people. It's about nature. It's not necessarily only for people. We need nature for nature's sake as well. But unless we can do it with people, we're not going to be able to achieve that goal. So it's a complex, it's a complex question. And as you say, your answer can go in a hundred different ways. But I know in my soul that we need wilderness areas. But I also know that to touch people, we need to be able to take them into those wilderness areas so that we can inspire them to care 
so that we can inspire them to do the simple things at home, whether it's issues related to use of, of power, use of electricity, pollution, et cetera, et cetera, plastics. We, we need to touch people because that is going to be the, the most important thing. I think as most natural scientists, I started off believing that if people know enough, then they'll care. I don't believe that anymore. I think we do need knowledge. It is a component, but we have to touch people's hearts. We have to be able to inspire them to care. And then we have to empower them to be able to make those changes. Because if we don't empower them, we end up leaving people with that either feeling of overwhelmed, it's too big, I can't do anything, or else we feel them go, oh my goodness gracious me, it's, it's all so terrible, there's, there's no way, it's, the problem's over, we can't do anything about it. So I believe knowledge is important, but I certainly don't believe it's as important as, as I used to believe. And we've got to be able to touch people and touch people emotionally, because that's going to be one of the, the routes to, to making a difference. And all of our research is showing that that giving people an emotional connection is, is far more effective in the long term than just a, an intellectual connection. Um, and I guess that's a, that's a really good uh, segue into kind of uh, your, your inspiration and how you got started. Because like you said, you've been with Sombra for, since 1992, and which as someone who's been with a different organization every three to five years, <laughs> that's, it's, it's kind of cool to see. Um, so I guess like how, how, what was it that sparked you to get involved so early with Sombra or get involved with saving species or the ocean or, or whatever it was so early? I, I, was, I was really lucky because my dad was passionate about the ocean and he really wished that he'd had a son as his firstborn. So he took me fishing. So for my, my second birthday, apparently the story goes that all I wanted was a fishing rod and an umbrella so that I could go fishing with my dad if it rained. So I've been brought up in a, in a family that, that really cares for the environment. My dad loved nature, he loved forests, he loved trees, he loved birds, and particularly he loved fish and, and the sea. I remember when I was about 11 years old, I was pottering around the rocks near to, to where we went on holiday down in the, the wild coast, which is part of the east coast of South Africa. And I remember thinking that when I grow up, I want to teach people about these animals that live in the rock pools, because that was the best thing I could think of was, was spending time at low tide exploring the rock pools. And then, yeah, I sort of grew up and I knew that I wanted to study fish. So I went to Rhodes University to study fish. And the first thing I did was went to see the professor of ichthyology. And he said, well, you're a woman. You're not going to make it in this field. And then he said, if you do want to make it in this field, you'd better major in maths because we need statistical ichthyologists. So I took a deep breath and I thought a little bit about this and decided I was going to prove him wrong. I couldn't do anything about the female bit, so I was going to just carry on there. I tried maths for a year and scraped through with 52%. So I thought, oh dear, my, my career as an ichthyologist is over. But to cut a long story short, I, I ended up finishing doing a master's in ichthyology. And my first job was the education officer in the aquarium. And it was like a dream come true because I could do that thing that I wanted to do when I was 11 years old, which is, is teach children about the rocky shores and obviously a whole lot more. So my inspiration comes way back and I'm incredibly, incredibly privileged to have had the opportunity to, to do what I really believe in for so long. The career that I've had has changed paths along the way. But I'm, I'm really grateful for, for all the experiences I've had. And one of the things that I, I really, really love doing is, is sharing conservation communication skills with people. So work that we've done up in East Africa, in, in Uganda, working with conservation educators. That's just so inspiring because in Africa, we, we don't have a lot of resources. And yet when I work with these conservation educators in, in other African countries and I see what they can achieve with so little, I, I realize just how 
amazing human ingenuity is, but also just how passionate they are. Often, if you're an educator in a, in a first world country, if you don't have all the mod cons, you just sort of say, well, then I can't do the course. Whereas these educators and us will do something under a tree with a flipboard. We don't need electricity. We don't need all of those resources. And yeah, I, I truly love working with, with our African educators throughout the country or throughout Africa because, because of that passion. And that's, that's really what inspires me every day is, is the passion of, of South African people who really care for the environment and care for each other because that's, that's what's gonna get us through. That's what's gonna make the difference. Do you mind speaking to that, Judy, a little bit? Um, speaking to, I don't know which way you'd like to go with it, but so much came up for me with that story, with, with you being told so early on in your life that you're not going to make it if you're not a man um, in this field. Um, you know, obviously, the first place I go to, I mean, that's the opposite of what an educator should be. An educator should be somebody that inspires you, should be somebody that empowers you, that encourages you. Um, and I hear a lot of those stories for educators early on, like Austin just shared, just being discouraged from what they want to do. Um, so I'm curious about that. But then the other thing that's interesting to me um, in conservation is, and, and I'd love to get your take on this if you're, if you're willing to, um, the role of women in leadership positions in conservation. Um, I don't know other uh, fields as well as I know conservation. So I don't know if this is the same in banking or finance or whatever, but just a couple of days ago, the new uh, IUCN uh, president, uh, the, the first Muslim woman, um, uh, or I forget how they phrase it, um, uh, Elizabeth Marema, uh, the new leader for Convention for Biological Diversity. There's so many of these female leaders in conservation. Um, and it's, and so many of them have the same story as you uh, that, that we're being told, you know, you can't do this if you're not a man. Do you mind speaking to a little bit of that and how maybe that's changing or how maybe it's not changing or um, what does it mean to have such strong female leadership in conservation today? I think that, so I'm going to answer two sides to that question. And the first one pertains to, to the need for affirmation when somebody's starting out in a career. And I often do career talks. So talk to, to young people who might be interested in a career in the marine environment. And I generally say a few things. The first one is that don't let anybody else dictate your passion. So if you are passionate about the environment, if you're passionate about conservation, don't let anybody discourage you. We need passion far more than we need skills in maths or anything else, because it's that passion that's going to drive you through the hard times. Being in conservation is not easy. It's often discouraging. We see things we love disappearing very often. So you've got to keep that passion. You, you've got to have that passion. And I often say when, when I hire staff is I should hire for attitude and train everything else because the attitude is the one thing that you can't change. So if you're passionate about conservation, you will make it happen. We were always told, don't choose conservation, you'll never get a job. Then we were told, don't choose conservation because you'll never make any money. It's not about that. There is no greater gift than to go to work every day and say, I love my job. Okay, not maybe every day, but at least four days out of five and to feel that you're making a difference. So I always advise people that if you're passionate about conservation, you will find a way. There is, there will be a way to, to make it happen. And that's the first side to the question. The, the issue of, of women in leadership in conservation is, is an interesting one because we're certainly seeing an absolute, sure, massive shift just in the last probably five years where women in conservation leadership are suddenly coming to the fore. And it's got to do slightly with demographics. So a whole lot of, of older people who are mostly males are retiring. 
and females are being able to, to move into those positions. And some of those females have been mentored by amazing men. So the men have had a very important role to play. And some of them have been mentored by amazing women who've been behind the scenes, but they're only starting to come to the fore now. So we're definitely going to see more and more and more women in, in conservation. And that's, and that's really exciting. I think that across the board, we bring a different side to it. And I think that we need, we need everybody. So we need a, a diversity, just like a diverse ecosystem is a strong ecosystem. We need a diversity of leadership. So we need all voices at the table so that we can really move conservation forward. And each of us, as we said before, is wearing different lenses. I see the world differently as a female. Um, different people see the world differently from their cultural groups, and we need that diversity. But I'm excited to see more and more women coming into leadership positions. And yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to seeing where it, where it goes and, and the direction. Hopefully, hopefully we can yeah, just, just keep building on what we've got, improve where it needs to be improved and take things forward. Yeah, it's really, really great to hear your perspective on that because, you know, we did, we actually talked with uh, Dr. John Paul Rodriguez about that and we had a great conversation about that, about it. And it was, it was, you know, it was really, you know, beneficial, but in the end it was three guys talking about it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I think that's a great uh, segue into our, our kind of our last little section here. Um, because it, you know, we've talked a lot about inadvertently. We've talked a lot about uh, the future and you know the way to, the direction things are going, um, and that kind of brings up this question that we we like to discuss with everybody. It's uh, you know we we call this this series the Possibilists. Um, it's based off the Michael Soule quote. Uh, you know, when he's asked if he's uh, optimistic or pessimistic, he says he's possibilistic. And, you know, it's, he kind of leaves it at that. And so we're like, well, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, how do we, how do we interpret that? So it's, we're trying to explore that with every, everyone we talk to, because you, like you said, it's not um, optimism just for the sake of optimism. It's, it's based off of action. And so that's where we think possible possibilism goes, but do you mind kind of exploring uh, you know, the idea of optimism or possibilism in your field specifically in, in, in Africa, so that Southern Africa? I, I love the idea of, of possibilists because it's almost like a middle, a middle road. And for a long time, I gave these really meaningful presentations. So I would be asked to, to do a talk on conservation. And I would start off with what is happening to our oceans? And I'd give the greatest doom and gloom and hope that people were going to inspire it into action. So all of these terrifying statistics would inspire action. It wasn't working. And eventually, probably about 10 years ago, I decided I was going to call my, store, my talk stories of hope from the ocean. And it changed my perspective completely. And it changed the perspective of my audience. The first thing I had to do with that was actually go and find those stories of hope. So once I started researching stories of hope, I found two things. The one I found amazing stories of hope, whether it's marine protected areas, lionfish, the turtle story, the shark stories in South Africa, the whale stories. There were so many stories of hope I could share. But then also what I was able to share was stories of people because those stories of hope came about because of the passion of people. So I was able to find passionate people around our country who were making those stories of hope come true. And that was what I found really empowering. So my talks then changed from being all the doom and gloom to being stories about people who are making things possible. And they're the possibilists. They're the people who are making a difference. And I found that Certainly people leave my presentations a lot happier now, but I think they also leave with hope and that hope can inspire action. And that was really for me quite an epiphany was, was when I stopped preaching loss and I started to preach possible and what can be done. And then telling the stories of the people behind it, because so often we think that organizations do stuff. It's not organizations that do stuff. It's individuals with passion in an organization that make it happen and people that have been prepared to, to stick with it. 
So it's telling those stories that I've found to be most empowering. And, and that's why I love the possibilists because you're, you're connecting people who are doing things that make a difference. And, and that's really, really empowering for other people. I think that often people look at other people doing stuff and they go, mm, I don't think I could ever do that. I'm not, I'm not this or that or the next thing. And I think that it's finding the fact that actually none of us are particularly amazing at anything, but we just really, really want to do something. We want to make a difference. And I always go back to that passion because that passion is what's got to keep us, keep us going. So just showing that normal people can do, can do good things. If they find the right people to work with and they really believe in it, they can make it happen. And yeah, that's a possibilist, somebody who can make it happen. As someone who's not particularly amazing at anything, I, I do appreciate that, <laughs> that idea. <laughs> um, and I, I especially like the way you worded it earlier, uh, where you said, we want to uh, preach love, not loss. And I definitely think we'll use that tagline for certain things in the future, because it, it's just it's exactly what we're doing. And it's, it's so perfect. Just, just to go with that, and as I say, I can't remember where I, I read that love not lost, but it, it certainly changed my approach to things. Um, the, other, the other quote that I can't remember who said it, but I think that it's something that I keep on reminding myself is that there may come a time when I can't make a difference, but I hope there never comes a time when I don't try. And I think that in conservation, we just have to keep trying. So I guess with all that said, can you uh, share where our viewers, our listeners can uh, get involved with both locally, if they live in South Africa, or, you know, if they live in Los Angeles here, how, how can they help? How can they get involved with, with your organization? So I think that there are two sides to this. So the first thing is, I think that from a, a bigger picture point of view, people who, who want to make a difference for, for conservation can, can help by firstly finding out what needs doing, talking to people, getting out there, just, just learning more and then sharing what they know. That's the first step I always say when, when people say, oh, I don't know, I don't know how to make a difference. The, the first step is, is find out what needs doing and then talk to people about it. Share, share your knowledge and your interest in something and then figuring out what, what little role you can play because each of us can play a role, whether we're in California or in Uganda or, or in Hong Kong, each of us can, can make a difference. Um, on our side, our organization's website is www.saambr.org.za. And there I would suggest if people would like to go onto our Marine Protected Areas page, because that's a story I would love to share. Um, we have these special days. So there's a special day for World Environment Day, for World Oceans Day, for there's even a, a World Octopus Day. But we've never really had a Marine Protected Areas Day. So at the beginning of this year, I said, right, we're going to start Marine Protected Areas Day. So the first thing I did was I phoned a few friends and I said, hey, do you want to join us on MPA Day? And they all said, sure, what's MPA Day? And I said, I don't really know, but we'll figure it out as we go along. So we put together this tiny little team of people from different organizations, and we had a budget of exactly zero. So we didn't have any money, but we had lots of passion. And we've, we managed to pull it off. So on the 1st of August, we celebrated Africa's first ever Marine Protected Area Day. We had lots and lots of media. We had all sorts of uh, COVID compliant activities. We did a virtual tour of four of our marine protected areas online. And it was just amazing to see the energy and enthusiasm of people. Every single person we asked to help said yes, and then went beyond the call of duty. And I think that that tells me two things. The one is that people are desperate for good news. The world is, is a tough place right now. So people are really looking for good news and people are looking for something where they can make a difference. So where they can help, it empowered people. So those were the two, the two lessons that I learned is that people really do want to, to make a difference if you're giving them the opportunity to do that. So as, as leaders in conservation, it's part of our responsibility to give people those opportunities where they can make a difference. 
it's one thing to tell people, well, figure it out for yourself. It's another thing to, to be able to open doors that people can then walk through. And that's what MPA Day taught me, is that if we open the doors, people really do want to walk through. People want to make a difference. So that was the start. And I'm really hoping that next year we're going to be able to celebrate Marine Protected Areas Day around the world. We've had expressions of interest from people in different countries. And I'm looking forward to, to us being able to, to grow it to, together with colleagues around the world because it'll highlight an important issue, which is marine protected areas, but it also gives people an opportunity to do something that's that's positive and, and get the discussions and the, the narratives around marine protected areas more open. So that's just a, an aside completely to, to your main question. But the main question, if you'd like to find out more about our organization, go to our website. <laughs> Yeah, well, Dr. Judy Mann, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is a, a great conversation, and we're so excited by the work you do and you know, looking forward to supporting you in the future and hearing more about it. Thank you so much to you guys for what you're doing. Sharing, sharing our messages and amplifying what we're doing is, is incredibly valuable. Often it's very difficult to, to share stories like this. So for you to, to be able to, to share them for us is, is so useful. So thank you very much. We'd like to thank Dr. Mann for taking the time to talk with us, as well as Sombra for all the amazing work they do. Please look into their programs if you're ever in South Africa, and please get involved. Hosts and producers for this episode are Austin and Taylor Parker. Producers are Kat Coots and Andrea Santi. Music was provided by A Picture Book Studios. Please like, comment, and subscribe to our page if you haven't already. And thank you for tuning in. We'll talk to you next time.